All right, so more refined portrait painting of George Bernard Shaw here. So the great advantage of digital painting is that you have layers, right? So I've got this refined painting layer on top of my base painting layer. So I don't need to worry about screwing something up because I know my base painting has the core of the image already there. So I'm not going to lose place of where his features go or what the shape of his head is. But what I can do is because I'm zoomed in to about 25%, actually I'm only zoomed in a third, that's about as much as I want to zoom in because I don't want to get too detailed into the individual pixels because the actual pixels are like that. And that just won't feel as interesting painting, right? And it won't make much of a difference. So I want to paint in ways that make a difference to the navigator here. So about 33%, I can work around it. And as I work, this little picture will change. Right. And hopefully just get more and more refined. I'm still just stealing a lot of colors from my overlaps. And then I want to get kind of the unique features of these wrinkles around his eyes. And notice I'm not needing the, the full palette much anymore because all of these colors are well represented basically anywhere I paint. Which is different than stenciling or airbrushing or a really clean style of painting. But you're going to work with your own. So you can work as far away or as smooth as you like, but always be aware of what it looks like from a distance. Now we don't get a lot of time for this project. It's just to introduce you to this process and the steps of digital painting. Some of you will just love it and want to work a lot more on it, which is great. But even in a short time, no matter how short a time you have for an assignment or a project, you want to try, and that's what I'm going to endeavor to do here, to bring everything up to the same level so that just one area doesn't seem just glaringly unfinished or not considered. So I'm curving around the bridge of the nose here, layering up. There wasn't a whole lot of color there. It looks very scribbly, but I'm actually trying to give it some defined form. And I can check that and see that in the navigator. Every once in a while, it's good to hit Command S, save your progress. That will help clear some of the cache memory. 
but I don't want to have to close Photoshop all the way because then I'll lose my whole setup and have to do that again. And if you're painting in color, it's always good to mix with warms and cools. The standard is to have cool shadows and warm highlights, kind of like I have on the nose. But you can subvert that, mess with that, like this reference does, which has some, some highlights that are cool, those greens, and some shadows that are warm, those oranges, which is actually kind of similar to what I've set up here. If you're interested in these kind of extreme color techniques, a lot of these were principles of the Fauvist art movement in the early 20th century. And the leading artist of that that you could research would be Henri Matisse. And they were called Fauvist because it means wild animal. <laughs> and their color explorations were kind of more important than just their subjects. They were very inspired by post-impressionist and expressionist artists, people like Van Gogh and Gauguin, who just really cared more about what the colors did emotionally to the viewer than the, the accuracy of their subject matter. And because portraits are such straightforward subject matter, that's kind of how I feel. Let them be an excuse for for really interesting textures and colors. And maybe that helps reveal who the person is. But I definitely want my portraits to look very different when you get up close to them than they look from far away. From far away, they just look like a cool, colorful painting, very clear who it is. They look very human, they look very believable. When you get up close, you just, you're surprised by all the different color choices. Just like if you get up to a person, especially an older person, and you see the surface of their skin, and you just realize how complex it is. How many things it has going on interesting. I like facial hair because it gives me complete freedom to just scribble and mess around. But I still want to keep in mind the values. Where are their shadows? Where is their texture and highlight? How do I frame it on the face and make it look as refined as the eyes and the nose? So now that I've pretty much finished off in my refined painting, the triangle of the eyes and the nose, right, which can look pretty cool with the sketch just on its own, just the refined painting. Right. Now I wanna work around that into the forehead, the facial hair, the ear. And so I'll zoom out a little bit more, but not increase my brush at all. And if I wanted my painting to be photorealistic and really smooth, in the end, I would eventually work to a, a much smaller brush so that it was basically controlling every pixel to look photographic by the end. And you just work general to specific. So there's, I can't rush in and just finish off one little area without kind of sacrificing the rest. I need to kind of know the direction I'm going. Now for you art majors, thinking about how you'll make a career in art, what you'll spend your time doing. Well, if you wanna just be a freelance portrait artist, 
digital is a pretty good way to go because you can output so many different types of art product from it, right? Just like you can with spot illustrations or anything else. But your subject matter really becomes the main selling point. And so I like to do things like authors, creative people, playwrights, poets, musicians, all deceased so I don't have um, issues of, of copyright or of um, usage rights of their image. And hopefully deceased, you know, like 50 years at least. Basically, if there's a color photograph of them, they're too new. <laughs> and then who's likely to buy your work like that? Well, people that are fans of that person's legacy, that person's artwork. But you also have to kind of know it and do justice to it with your artistic interpretation. So if you need a little bit more space to see, you can at any time in Photoshop hit tab and it will get rid of all the toolbars. And I can still paint this way, just holding down options, stealing colors. I don't need to have all the, the things visible. So if, if you like more simplicity, you can go that way. And then tab brings them all back. But especially when you're working with reference, sometimes space is a big factor. All right. So now I get to really play with this brush, even though it's not that small, because it's pressure sensitive. I can build up the texture of the beard. He's kind of flyaways, especially around his mustache at the edges. And I'm not trying to use just pure white. I'm using purples and grays and variations. And then cutting back with shadows. Even though I got a lot of color going on, gray is also a big part of what I'm using. But they're purplish grays, greenish grays, orangish grays, what are called chromatic grays. So you basically scribble in direction then cover up and digital paint is not like watercolor and not like oil and not like acrylic though it can look like any one of those in that even though I have a, a transparent paint medium here it's only at 76 percent opacity at any time I can completely cover up what's underneath and completely erase and fix but notice I'm not using my eraser at all. That would be a waste of, of time to switch tools. I just paint over and redefine the edge with a new paint choice when I want to change something. Now I'm getting to that kind of zen place where I'm not really saying anything of importance. This is a form of teaching called cognitive modeling. I just tell you what I'm thinking as I'm doing it. But in painting, when you're at this stage, you're not thinking, you're just reacting. And your eyes are doing all the work for you. I wish there was a way to speed it up, but I haven't found one. 